Uh, Jeroen Oskam is my colleague at Hotel School The Hague since 2015. Uh, he's the direction of the research center of Hotel School The Hague, uh, which is uh, trying to bridge the gap between the academic world and the hospitality industry and education. Uh, Jeroen has worked at Stenden, has founded Saragossa Hotel Management School in Spain and has worked at uh, Hotel School Maastricht as well. And uh, like we already discussed a little bit last time as well, like looking at all these backgrounds and all these, these types of uh, jobs, you would expect something within the hospitality industry. However, uh, Jeroen has obtained his PhD uh, on a study regarding the censorship in Spain during the Fraco uh, dictatorship from the University of Amsterdam. And the last years, uh, Jeroen has become an expert in various topics regarding the sharing economy, and Airbnb in particular. And recently, uh, he is, like many of us, involved in uh, topics regarding the COVID-19 and the effects of that on, uh, on the hospitality industry. So, uh, welcome, Jeroen. Thank you, Daphne. And uh, welcome, everybody. And uh, I hope you can hear me uh, well this time. I'm going to share my screen and then I can start my uh, presentation. Um, which one is it? It's this one, right? Am I visible? Uh, is my presentation visible for, to all of you? So uh, this presentation is about uh, the research that we're currently doing at Hotel School The Hague into restaurant entrepreneurship and in particular in the vulnerability of these businesses in times of crisis. The presentation is structured uh, as follows. So in the first place, I, um, I, I have to introduce, uh, I understand a little bit what we do exactly at Hotel School The Hague to give you some context about, uh, about this research. Then I want to uh, give you a brief outline of the restaurant sector. Then uh, the, the little things we know about restaurant entrepreneurs. Uh, as, as I will show you, there's not so much research done into this. Then I will uh, talk a little bit about crisis impact. And unfortunately, we know much more about crisis impact than about restaurant entrepreneurship. And finally, I will uh, speak about uh, what we're currently uh, researching about resilient business models uh, in this sector. But please mind that these are um, uh, avenues for further research rather than com completed research findings. And um, I'm, I'm happy to present this to you. And I would also encourage you, I would also welcome your ideas uh, and, and your comment about what we're doing. And maybe I can also encourage you or, or, or your students to step into this uh, under-researched uh, field of restaurant entrepreneurship. So uh, to introduce our school, uh, often there's a misunderstanding. People feel that we are some kind of a cooking school, uh, which is not exactly the case. We are an independent HBO school, uh, a University of Applied Sciences. We are quite small. We have uh, 2,700 students uh, divided over two campuses in Amsterdam and in The Hague, uh, which makes us a small independent university, but a very large school in this discipline. We have uh, quite a good reputation, uh, both nationally and internationally. We were founded in 1929, so we are the oldest school in this area in the Netherlands. And uh, for many years now, we have had held a number one position in the Netherlands, but we also have a number number ten, uh, a top ten global position uh, since a uh, number of years uh, in in the international QS ranking. And for instance, we leave many, we leave all the UK universities in this field behind us. Uh, we also leave uh, schools like uh, Cornell behind us and most of the uh, Australian universities. Our research, um, what we do in research, and as Daphne said correctly, so what we try to do is we try to make our research uh, uh, relevant uh, for the hospitality industry, which means selecting very timely topics that, uh, that people can use in a profession. And we try to bridge that by, for instance, publishing both uh, in academic uh, outlets as well as um, a more dissemination work. 
Now, the areas that we covered, uh, they, they change according to what the business needs. Uh, we also do a lot of contract research, but one of the big areas is what is hospitality and what is hospitable behavior? What does that mean for people? Um, we were one of the first to step into the research on Airbnb and sharing, and, and that has given us a huge advantage. And uh, we were one of the most, uh, one of the first European institutes in any case that has published a lot about the development of Airbnb and also the, the downsides of Airbnb development. We do a lot about strategic HR management. Uh, we have recently started a research line, uh, by the way, in, in, uh, in uh, cooperation with uh, people, with your colleagues at the, at the VU, into food circularity. And we have a strong research line in revenue management. But last March, all of a sudden, overnight, uh, people lost interest in all these um, very uh, timely uh, topics, and, and we had to switch to a different uh, area of research. So uh, to give you an illustration, uh, one week before the lockdown started, we had been discussing labor shortages with uh, the Amsterdam hotel sector. Um, we had been uh, discussing, I had uh, just prepared my manuscript uh, for a book on overtourism in Amsterdam and I was luckily allowed by the publisher to, uh, to, to, to make a preface that uh, spoke about current under tourism in Amsterdam and how that should be interpreted. Uh, in, in food waste, we have been trying to guide restaurants to make efficiency, to take efficiency measures to, to save costs by uh, by reducing food waste. We have been working a lot with uh, hospitals to make their approach to patients more hospitable. Now. A large part of our research has been uh, reoriented, reoriented since the lockdown uh, on topics uh, to help businesses in the current crisis. And, and the, the questions are obvious. How hard will the industry be hit? What are survival strategies for hotels, for restaurants? What is the future for business travel? Will it recover to pre-crisis levels or will, will we, for instance, continue to meet each other through these, uh, through these means. We were discussing before the session started how well that worked and how well that works in student defenses, et cetera. So will business, uh, business travel uh, change their habits for good? How will cost uh, customer behavior be affected? So will we start traveling again or will, be afraid, will we be afraid? And for instance, will Airbnb disappear or will it resurge after the, the most severe lockdowns? And again, as I said in the beginning, we have many questions, but we have not come up with brilliant solutions and answers to these questions. I want to give you a brief outline of the restaurant sector uh, to give you um, that is different in, in each country. Um, in, in many European countries, it's very similar. But for instance, in, in the United States and North America, it's very different. So if you look at the Dutch restaurant sector with CBS uh, figures, we have more or less 60,000 businesses. And almost all of these businesses are small and medium enterprises. 52,000 of these businesses are food and beverage services, meaning restaurants and bars. And also all these businesses, almost all of these businesses are small and medium enterprises. In fact, the few large restaurant companies that we have in the Netherlands are those restaurants that are operated as part of hotel chains, for instance, like Fletcher or Accor Hotels. Those are the big restaurant companies. And not only are restaurants small businesses, they are tiny businesses. Half of the restaurants have only one employee, meaning the owner. And an additional 15% have two employees, meaning normally the owner and his or her partner. Um, the sector is responsible, has, has 60,000 jobs and is responsible for 10 billion euros in, uh, in added value. But um, as we have noticed in the last few months, uh, the importance of the sector is not so much economic. Uh, but mainly, and, and this is the reason why we missed the sector so much, is social and cultural. Uh, a few years ago, I, uh, I heard um, uh, um, 
uh, then Minister of Culture, Ronald Plastek, uh, describing the sector as the, um, the living room of society. And he argued that uh, in, in people's lives, many of the milestones in our lives take place in, in restaurants and bars. And he gave the example of graduation par parties, uh, meeting one's friends and maybe even meeting one's partner, um, a wedding or uh, meetings after a funeral. And he also said that um, if you, uh, you want to detect when parts of a city come to life, and I'm, I'm looking now at uh, Amsterdam North from my window, if you, if you want to see which parts of the city come to life, you have to look at the restaurants and bars coming up. And I think if I think of Amsterdam North, uh, that it has become more popular among people in, in the rest of the city, not so much because the subway line that we now have, but mainly because we now have many popular bars and restaurants. This picture uh, describes, uh, depicts the uh, consumption of wine and the history of the consumption of wine per liter, so that is not directly related to the history of restaurants and bars in the Netherlands. But it, uh, it does uh, illustrate an underlying trend, an, uh, an underlying consumer trend uh, towards um, different types of consumption and towards what we call the democratization of the restaurant. So as you see, until uh, the beginning of the 1960s, people hardly drank wine. At that moment, also people hardly went to restaurants. So most people only went to a restaurant one time in, in their lives, and that was when they during their wedding or something. Um, in 1965, 85% uh, of the people in the Netherlands rarely or never ate in restaurants. And uh, uh, 15 years later, that had completely turned around, and then 75% of the people ate in restaurants on a regular basis. Uh, these are more recent numbers, and they also show uh, how restaurant uh, visits uh, have spread, have been popularized among different generations. So not only are younger generations the ones that go to a restaurant more frequently, but they also use a, a they also have adopted a different trend, which is eating in, meaning getting food delivered to your home for convenience. Now, this is a general panorama of, uh, of the restaurant sector in the Netherlands, and, and these are hardly su any surprising numbers. And the only thing that, that may be striking is that you see uh, a decline in, in a sector that has driven the popularity of the restaurants after the Second World War, which is the Chinese restaurant. The, Chinese res the number of Chinese restaurants has declined, is declining. And that is not so much because uh, these restaurants are disappearing, but because in this community there is a very professional and innovative uh, segment of restaurateurs that are, uh, that are diversifying and adopting different kitchens uh, in, in that segment. So the, the traditional Chinese restaurant is uh, becoming less popular, but the same business people are adopting new concepts and new trends. This is, these are numbers from 2015 about the average uh, budgets in, uh, in Dutch restaurants, and they re very uh, nicely illustrate a rule of thumb in restaurant businesses, which says that 30% of your costs have to be food costs. Your labor cost may not exceed 30% either. Then you have 30% for all your fixed costs, and that leaves you with more or less 10% of business results. Recently, these numbers have, have come under pressure. So, in, especially in the United States, we know that this number has been declining to single digit uh, uh, business results. Margins are down to 3 to 9% in many American businesses. Now, going to the restaurant entrepreneur. Uh, we not, do not know a lot about restaurant entrepreneurs and the research that has been done 
has been done mainly in the United States and in some Asian countries. And I said in the beginning, in those countries, the sector really presents different characteristics. Uh, two years ago, we made a book where we tried to translate these research findings from abroad mainly uh, into an accessible, uh, in, in accessible language that was available for restaurant entrepreneurs. And here you see the presentation of this book to uh, Hotel School de Heek, former student Joris Beidendijk, who is the chef at the Rijksrestaurant. And this book uh, is, is still available and, and gives a, a nice overview of, of the few things that we know. If I look back to some older literature, the restaurant entrepreneur is characterized as follows, uh, initially two types, later three types. In the first place, the artisan, which is, has a humble background, a hands-on manager, risk avoiding, lacks a long-term perspective, and is in it to make enough money to live comfortably. And in contrast, they have the opportunist, which is mainly the business person with a higher level of education and who is focusing on profit and growth. And in later studies, they added a third category, the humanist, who is mainly motivated by interacting with guests and staff. I would say that this categorization is a little bit obsolete. If you look at the example of Joris Beidendijk, I think that we have many restaurateurs with uh, a different, different characteristics, at least in the European or in the, in the Dutch restaurant sector. If we uh, are doing uh, research about uh, restaurant uh, entrepreneurs, we mainly look at uh, the influence, the, the, the predictive value of, of several entrepreneurial traits uh, on, on their business success. But the problem is that this dependent variable of business success is hard to operationalize. So for instance, is it about making money? Is it about uh, staying in business for a long time? Or is it about customer satisfaction? Is it about making people happy? Now, if we do qualitative research, we find that primarily the, the, the answers that we get are about uh, making customers happy, so customer satisfaction is the main driver, apparently, for many restaurant entrepreneurs. And uh, you could say that there is some kind of um, uh, artistry feeling that restaurant, uh, restaurant entrepreneurs have. So they want to, uh, rather than making just money or staying in business, they want to excel by cooking nice food and they want to offer um, excellent experiences to their, to their customers. That is how they would like to stand out. Uh, two years ago, uh, a group of students did uh, some uh, more elaborate research into um, self-ascribed uh, entrepreneurial traits by restaurant entrepreneurs, and they tested uh, a group of, uh, of 12 different um, uh, characteristics that I had found in literature. And as you can see, almost all of these were found important, but there is a cluster of five uh, top qualities that they, uh, that they uh, find that stand out. In the first place, it's guest service skills. In the second place, it's quality of the products that are offered. It's business skills. It's the quality of the concept. And it's the knowledge of financial management. From also qualitative research, one finding that we can confirm in the research that we do in the Netherlands is that successful restaurant entrepreneurs can accurately explain their business concept. And that means going beyond just describing a product or a type of food. So a concept is not fish or vegan, but give a more elaborate description of what they want to offer in their restaurant. Another salient uh, result is that workload is is the main issue for many restaurant operators and, and, and uh, work-life balance. Um, work-life work balance is very hard to achieve, especially in the first years of business. So successful restaurant entrepreneurs are found to be single or divorced or particularly good at balancing work, uh, family life. And, and that often means that the family works along in the restaurant. And you also see that the history of a restaurant, the business cycle of restaurants, 
coincides with the family cycle of the of the families that are responsible for the restaurants. Now we ha had an unexpected finding uh, last year with uh, where a student did large scale research among uh, uh, restaurant entrepreneurs operationalizing business success as the time that they were in business. So she made two categories, businesses younger than five years and businesses five years or older. And uh, she uh, she interviewed she, she uh, did a survey where she checked the the big five trades, and unexpectedly she found that also uh, trades as openness, consciousness, extroversion, and agreeableness were higher among the restaurant entrepreneurs that have only in business for a shorter time, whereas restaurant entrepreneurs that were in business for more than five years scored lower on these numbers. So we haven't been able to interpret this yet uh, very accurately, but one option could be that those are actually two different groups of entrepreneurs, those that start up new businesses and those that stay in business for a long time. Now, the crisis impact in the restaurant business, uh, on the normal circumstances, or so non-crisis circumstances, restaurants are already a very vulnerable sector. So we have a uh, 50 monthly bankruptcy in the Netherlands in the restaurant sector, and, and that has different uh, 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 explanations. But one is the low level of, uh, of profession professionalism and maybe uh, the, the low threshold, for, the low entrance threshold for people to enter into this business without sufficient no knowledge, whatever that knowledge may be. Uh, however, that must be nuanced a little bit because in the United States there has been some research about restaurant failure and about the numbers of failure. And what the researchers found was that if the uh, number of business failure were as high as were reported, it could never be the case that we had still so many restaurants. So the main finding that they had, and this is a somewhat older research, is that many restaurants, even if they fail, even if they go bankrupt, they stay in business. So they they are being taken over, but they they stay in business and maybe operated by even the same families or by other people. In crisis times, the average of 15 monthly bankruptcies uh, goes up, and we have seen that in the last uh, last crisis to 20 monthly bankruptcies. Now, we, here we have plotted in the last crisis the consumer confidence uh, with restaurant expenditure, and as can be expected, they are correlated. So if, if we have low consumer confidence, we have also lower expenditures in restaurants. But we do see, and that is the graph you see on, on your right-hand side, that there's also a switch in times of lower consumer confidence to to cheaper restaurants, to inexpensive uh, food outlets like fast food restaurants, snack bars, Chinese restaurants. So we see that in, in normal circumstances, people do not so much uh, cease to go out to restaurants, but rather they, they make different choices when they go out. Now the current crisis, and um, I think we predict that the current crisis is, is currently a single issue crisis uh, meaning it, it's all about the pandemic, but there is another uh, group of latent crises that is popping up. We already see social economic tensions coming up. We see uh, international tensions uh, growing. So uh, we think that the major crises that we have analyzed over the last century um, are almost always rooted in a, in a complex of different factors. And only historians after 30 years may be able to, to disentangle which of those factors was the dominant factor in the uh, final result of the crisis. But with our current knowledge, uh, this is in Spain what has been predicted uh, for recovery for the crisis. And we see the restaurant sector recovering mainly in, the, in these predictions, uh, dependent on people's confidence in sanitary measures. So as people uh, are, uh, if, if fear of contagion uh, is reduced, people start returning to restaurants. This is uh, news from Italy, 50,000 restaurants, uh, pizzerias and bars uh, are at risk of closure. And this is something that we also uh, see for the Netherlands. So we predict uh, a, a high level of, uh, of closures that may be somewhat postponed 
by the measures, but that is a, a real risk that hangs over the market. This is a scenario study by the Dutch uh, Industry Association uh, that estimates how much uh, businesses will go bankrupt and how, much, how many jobs will be lost under different circumstances. So it starts with uh, a reality, so this is already a few months old, where uh, the, the, the measures be taken by the, by the government to, uh, to cover uh, the, the, the losses in the business and, and to, to allow businesses to keep paying salary and, and other costs did not cover the 90% as, as promised, but 65%. And they said with those measures, and if we, if we suppose, because at that time that was not yet known, that businesses will reopen the 20th of May, 30% of uh, businesses in the sector will go bankrupt and 90,000 people will lose their jobs. So the first variable is, is are the measures, the, the measures as they were uh, taken initially, or will they be upscaled to, to 90% as was promised? Then they go to the next stage in, in the measures, which is uh, uh, opening with limited measures. And that was initially expected to last from May until October. And there they have one big variable in addition to the other variable that we had in the first phase. And that was social distancing, reducing the capacity of restaurants and bars, or what they call smart distancing, uh, tailor-made measures for businesses and restaurants. And they said if uh, social distancing would be the rule, in the end, in combination with limited measures to cover the losses in the sector, 75% of businesses would go bankrupt and 300,000 people will lose their jobs. And in the end, in the next period when uh, businesses start to go back to normal, in this case, what, what remains of uh, hotels, restaurants, and cafes uh, will, will fade away, will, will uh, eventually die. So this was also, of course, a political lobby uh, measure to, uh, to, to say, well, uh, we are dependent on increased measures and on smart distancing instead of the measures that you are taking right now. In the United States, um, this, these calculations are made with the Altman Z score, which uh, is a score that expresses the, uh, the credit risks of, of businesses. In the United States, uh, currently 65% of uh, publicly traded restaurants are at risk of uh, bankruptcy, and an, an additional 18% is in the gray area, meaning it's not safe either. Uh, so also here we see, we see big problems, and we are not talking here about the single person businesses or the family businesses that we are discussing in the Netherlands, but we are talking about publicly traded restaurants. But it is true that also in these, in this sector of publicly traded restaurants, the size of the restaurant is, uh, predicts a larger risk of, of business failure. So the smaller the restaurant, the bigger the risk of failure. Nearly two thirds of US public restaurants have a negative working capital. Well, normally that is not a very uh, strange situation in this sector because you must understand that you, you buy your supplies and, and you have your obligations towards your employees and you receive cash on a daily basis from your, for, from your clients. So basically your suppliers and your workers help you finance your business. But it also means that this business model in the current crisis situation uh, leaves uh, businesses without any financial buffers and makes them very vulnerable to, to sudden losses or sudden changes in situations such as the current lockdown. Now, finally, we go and, and, and a little bit speculatively, these are more hypotheses than, than real research findings about the, the business models. How can we make them more resilient? So our current research agenda looks into, uh, again, the entrepreneurial characteristics, which entrepreneurs have bigger chance of success and, and which entrepreneurs are insufficiently prepared to enter the sector. What measures should they have taken in this crisis or should they take in future crises to be less vulnerable to the effects? 
which innovation should be introduced? What is the human impact of company failure? So the, 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 the people, the, the, the families that are affected by business failures, the workers that are affected by business failures. And finally, how can employment in the sector be made more sustainable? Uh, as I told you in the beginning, a, a few months ago, we were discussing the labor shortages that were uh, uh, stopping growth of the sector in Amsterdam. And currently the situation has completely turned around and we are discussing excesses of labor. Now, going back to the business model. So I told you about a 30, 30, 30, 10 percent model. And this is from a blog uh, by the owner of an American restaurant chain, uh, a German street food chain. And uh, the title of his blog was very significant. It was uh, why restaurants are so fucked. And he describes in this presentation uh, his cost structure. So if we look at this uh, street food restaurant, we see in the first place that food costs are, uh, exceed uh, the 30%. And this is for a street food restaurant, which normally has, has uh, not the same amount of food costs as, as more upscale restaurants. Labor is under 30%. And overhead is also under 30%. And those two variables are uh, understandable in the context of a street food restaurant, which leaves them with a business result that is under the 10%. And that is already for this type of, of restaurant. There was a, an opinion piece in The Guardian uh, one month ago uh, that spoke about uh, the unsustainability of business models in the restaurant sector. Uh, they will be never the, they will never be the same again after the restaurant crisis, but that may be a good thing. And what this article argued was that really uh, because of price competition and because of our uh, as clients our willingness to pay for restaurant services, especially labor costs are ever more under pressure, and that leads to a very unsustainable and unfair system in restaurants. You may have heard that, uh, you may have seen that many restaurants have tried to switch to either delivery or takeaways. This is a student research that is ongoing in Amsterdam. And uh, you see here that um, uh, um, only, sorry, only few restaurants switched to delivery service in this, in this survey, which currently has an N of uh, 69, but more people uh, switched to take away services in, the, in this uh, period. But we also see that this uh, helps people to stay in business and, and, and to say uh, somewhat disrespectfully to keep them off the streets, but it hardly helps them to keep the business going because three quarters report that they have less than half of the turnover that they, they of the revenues that they would have before the crisis. Delivery, delivery service also uh, caused a different problem, and there was already some, some debate around this, uh, delivery services uh, before the crisis, in the first place because of increasing commissions that they asked for. Um, and in the second place, um, they changed the nature of the business, and this is something that we also see in hotels. If you think of the effect of Booking.com, it basically means that individual businesses give, give the, uh, or lose their marketing function and, and give away that marketing function to internet platforms. And um, the financial effect of, those, uh, of, of, of this trend is again shown uh, by the uh, uh, author of the same blog. So we go again back to the, to the dinner, to the street food restaurant with the, uh, the cost uh, structure that we saw before. And he commented that he now has applied a different cost structure for uh, uh, Uber Eats uh, takeouts. So in the first place, he has applied, he applies a different fees for takeouts than for, uh, for normal in restaurant consumption. This is not always allowed by all of the platforms. So this is not always a possibility that all restaurateurs have. Now, if you look at the different costs, you see in the first place that food costs have gone up slightly, and that is because of packaging. So packaging is more expensive, uh, only one dime, but uh, that adds up in the end. Labor costs go down, 
over, overhead goes down, of course, because you don't need the space, you don't need the same service for your clients. But uh, the delivery service takes a large bite, namely 30% out of your revenue, and still, in this case, Uber Eats is not profitable, and it leaves you with declining margins. So that is the risk uh, for the sustainability of the sector that these platforms represent. What innovations uh, can we uh, apply in the sector? There's a, one very nice example, and that was um, uh, more or less a decade ago in the Basque country, and that was a government-funded uh, uh, government funded project. Because of the fact that the Basque, the Basque country in northern Spain had uh, many uh, prestigious Michelin star restaurants, but many of those chefs were at the point of retirement, were close to retirement, so they thought regionally we have to do something and we they launched a large innovation platform that has been more or less successful in keeping the restaurant offer up to par in that part of spain uh, other innovations often speak about uh, automation and and uh, ict you always have to be careful because many of these uh, things are just uh, gadgets and and serve for the branding more than for actual operational improvements. Uh, there's one uh, interesting uh, uh, experiment at Wagamama and that is very close to uh, the view at, uh, at, at Boulenland. Uh, and, and that is the app that allows you to, uh, to stand up and go after you finish your meal. And that seems like a very trivial improvement, but the waiting time, especially for a restaurant that caters to business people that are having lunch there and, and have limited time to have lunch, to avoid that waiting time where people ask for their invoice and pay allows them to make uh, to to allow the restaurant to get additional turnover that is highly profitable if you think about uh, for instance a coffee or dessert we also predict that we see more experiments in different uh, differentiated pricing and restaurant revenue management we have done some uh, uh, research about it in the past already. Revenue management means that you uh, ask different prices to different customers, as we see in hotels, as we see at airlines. This is already a quite common practice in, in the United States, in some parts of Asia, in restaurants, where you pay more at different times, or uh, even to sit at, a, 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 at different tables in a restaurant, for instance, but with a better view. In Europe so far, we only know the happy hour, which is a, a very primitive form of revenue management. But another form of revenue management that was already introduced before the crisis was that in upscale restaurants in Amsterdam, uh, people, uh, uh, restaurants would uh, ask for a reservation fee. So they would ask people to pay an amount upfront if they wanted to reserve at that restaurant. So we expect this trend to increase. This is a very interesting experiment that addresses the fluctuation in fluctuations in the labor market. So we have fluctuations in times of crisis. So again, uh, three months ago, we had labor shortages and now we have an excess. We don't know what to do with all these uh, workers in, in the restaurant and, uh, and cafe sector. But we yearly have a similar or, or more reduced fluctuations, but uh, if, because of seasonality. So this is always a highly volatile uh, situation and uh, an interesting experiment is to see if if we can combine we can join forces with the health sector and see if uh, the, the the labor shortages there can be covered sometimes by labor excesses that we have in the restaurant and bar sector and vice versa uh, this picture is again from the uh, american restaurant sector mm -hmm. and uh, here you see uh, 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 a, a large market concentration in, in uh, a, a few big hotel, uh, a few big restaurant chains, uh, branded restaurants. And uh, what we fear, and, and this is also the reason that we, uh, that we seek to develop these uh, more uh, resilient business models, what we fear is that we will get a similar consolidation uh, after the current crisis, we expect a wipe out of small and medium businesses in the restaurant and bar sector in the Netherlands. And uh, one of the uh, grim scenarios is that then only big companies will step in and uh, and take over that, that market. 
and that there's not only a risk for the romantic idea that we can have of the small uh, and medium family restaurant, but it is also uh, uh, putting at risk the diversity we have in, this, in these sectors in, uh, in Europe. Uh, this is under debate because yesterday I, I discussed it with someone and he expects that uh, after a crisis, the first thing you see pop up like mushrooms are small family enterprises that have more power to innovate than big businesses. But this is a scenario that remains to be evaluated. So far, my, uh, my presentation. So, um, as I said, what we are doing currently are not yet complete findings, but um, I'm very interested in what you think. And I hope that I have been able to motivate you also to, to have a closer look at what's happening in, in this sector. If you are more interested in what we are doing in research, I also invite you to go to the Hotel School blog, where you will find more information about what we do. Thank you so far. Any questions or comments? Thank you, Jeroen. We're all clapping, but I think most people still have their microphone off, so uh, it's not too noisy. Um, well, in any case, that's a good sign because you have been able to hear me. So sometimes I was afraid because I didn't hear anything that nobody said anything. Oh, I see there are questions in the chat. I, I missed that. Sorry. There are questions. So yeah. we can do two things. I can uh, pick them out for you and just ask them to you, or you can go through them yourself, whatever you prefer, really. Uh, yeah. What percent, uh, what percentage of family business? I, I don't know exactly what percentage family businesses is, but I think that that um, uh, that number of single person uh, restaurants and, and two person restaurants gives a nice, nice clue. So it's 50% single person restaurants and 70% uh, two person restaurants that, uh, that operates it. Yes, um, another interesting question is whether these are more resilient. Uh, that's also something you refer to uh, at the end of your talk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that can be. I, I, I cannot answer, give, give a final answer to this. So what, what I can imagine is uh, you have one um, uh, variable that you, that you completely manage in a, in a one-person business, and that is how many hours you dedicate to your business and how many money you take out of that business. So uh, I, I suppose, but this is an hypothesis, uh, what I suppose is that many people work even if their restaurant is, is let's, let's say, technically bankrupt, they keep working in their restaurant, they keep working maybe 80 or 100 hours and making not insufficient money to, uh, to have that, that living, to have a decent salary, but they do that because they, they operate that business and they have also the, the dream to, uh, to, to have that business. So there's a certain romanticism always around uh, in, for restaurants and uh, for many restaurant entrepreneurs. The uh, following question is from Daphne. Dutch cuisine are croquette and pannenkoeken. Um, uh, well, um, yeah, I was just thinking it looks so nice, like to see like the French cuisine and everything, and then quite like the Dutch cuisine looked suddenly so big. And I was just wondering if it's like the snack bars and the. Um, no, like the, the normally the snack bars and cafeteria are categorized differently by CBS. Uh, I, I think the Dutch restaurants are, are just the restaurants that um, that don't have any specific ethical um, description. Um, yeah, um, I'm, I'm not a, a big fan of Dutch food either, but uh, I, there are people that defend that there is an interesting Dutch cuisine. And uh, you know, uh, Daphne, our colleague from uh, from Stende Albert Kooi, who has introduced a new Dutch cuisine with uh, with local food, etc. Uh, by the way, the local food trend is also something that uh, that is affecting that 30, 30, 30, 10 business model because uh, uh, oddly local food is uh, many times much more expensive than uh, than um, food that you buy in South America or in Africa. So that the our demands as as customers put uh, put that business model further under pressure. The, the mean yearly revenue approximately, uh, that is something I would have to look up for you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not able to answer that uh, right now. The following uh, refers to the personality dimensions. 
Oh, and, and uh, connect them to the uh, to the three types of restaurant entrepreneurs. Yes, that is interesting. So our hypothesis was that uh, to be a good restaurant entrepreneur, and and in the past, definitely, definitely, you have had uh, you have done a lot of uh, research also about hospitality and hospitableness, and mainly in hotels. Um, um, but you found certain uh, traits in the, uh, among the big five where they would where uh, that that predicted more a more hospitable attitude. Um, we thought that things like openness and uh, and uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, creativeness and, and 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 those traits would predict a restaurant success, whereas uh, um, what um, uh, uh, what is the, the the other one the the neurosis or the um, uh, what is the last one? Yeah, neuroticism in the big neuroticism, five. Yeah. That, that that would predict that would be a negative predictor for restaurant success, but but, but we were not able to to replicate uh, that in, in in that study. So we found that that young businesses had a different type of entrepreneur, and the older businesses had a more in, introvert type of entrepreneur. In in that was a sample of uh, 180 restaurants in Nijmegen, and and we haven't been able to explain that yet. But in any case, so I think that. Um, uh, this this American description of three categories. So if I think of Joris Beidendijk and, and if I think of the romanticism of many uh, restaurant entrepreneurs, uh, it, it's uh, many times, and I don't have numbers about how many times, but many times it's a different type of business than uh, a shoe store in the sense that these people uh, see themselves uh, partly as artists. And, and um, as artists, they want to wanna present uh, the best food uh, they forget about the costs. They forget about decoration costs of the restaurant. So that is a pitfall for many restaurant entrepreneurs. Mm. In the Big Five study, uh, the sample size was, oh, that was a nine-man study. It was 180. Mm. Uh, so you had uh, um, 180 with a, a range from zero to how many years in business? Um, yeah, I think, but this is from memory. I think there were like 60 that were um, um, uh, under five years in business and, uh, and 120 that were uh, five years and up mm. in business. I, I don't have the effect, effect sizes here. So normally what we do, so we um, we have students uh, feel the waters to say, so is there something there? And then if, if that uh, that leads to something, then we, we dive into that and, and we, we try to to replicate that study ourselves and, and to see if there's really something uh, significant uh, coming out of that. Mm. Which sector is more affected, hotels, restaurants, or bars, and why? Um, yeah, there's different hypotheses. Uh, so one of the things may be that uh, if, if we now cannot travel or, or will not travel as much, that hotels will, will be most affected and there, that there will be substitute spending, substitute consumption in restaurants and bars. So Dutch people stay in the Netherlands on their holidays and, and the money that they save to go on a holiday is what they will spend in restaurants and bars. That, that is one of the hypotheses. I don't know if I uh, concur with that. I, um, uh, I'm, I'm, um, my scenarios are often uh, a little bit pessimistic and I think that currently, uh, let's say the um, the general feeling that we have is that we have now, uh, we all experience some kind of optimism because we can do more than we uh, could do two weeks ago. But I think that optimism is not uh, is not based on the economic outlook that we have. So I think that many small businesses and especially restaurants and bars have been able to survive uh, these, these, three, these three months because of the buffers that they had plus the government support that they had. But the big blow is is yet to come, and I also think because um, many people, I, I think it's a mistake to consider the the effects of the crisis just in terms of uh, sanitary fear. Uh, the, the main thing that will happen is uh, is consumer confidence that is plummeting, and that will have the biggest effect I think on on Russian expenditure. Um, we did a different study uh, on, uh, on a related subject, but we, we studied the pandemic plans that were in place. And uh, because we were asked, uh, we were also by hotel companies, what, what are the scenarios and, and, and what is bound to happen here? 
And strangely enough, we dove into because every country, uh, we knew that a pandemic would come. We only did not know when it would come. So every country uh, compulsorily had a, a pandemic plan in place uh, that was uh, coordinated by the WHO. And all these plans uh, basically said, well, what governments should do is uh, prevent fear, uh, keep businesses running. Um, there will be economic damage uh, because of labor absenteeism, because people get sick or they die. And, and that will cause economic damage. And maybe in the end, at the later stage of a second or a third wave, even some stores or some schools will have to close because of mortality and, and morbidity. And um, so uh, this is not to criticize the measures that have been taken, but, but the, the finding is, and, and that is something that, that we should look into, and, and maybe historians in, in 2050 should look into, if we had these plans, and we basically, uh, the plan was Sweden, the Sweden scenario, if we had these plans, why all of a sudden did we take such different measures? Is that justified by the severity of the, of the illness? Or, or, or uh, that could be, that could be a, 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 a good justification. But it also explains that, uh, for instance, in 2006, there was a European Commission study about the influence of uh, an influenza pandemic in, in Europe. And that predicted uh, a GDP damage, uh, an average GDP damage of 0.7% and a V-shaped recovery in one and a half year. And it's, it seems obvious that we're not heading in that direction, that we're heading in a, in a different direction. So, so we did something different. We may have had good reasons to do so, but the, the, re uh, the, the effect is that we don't know what will happen next. And um, uh, I think that uh, the big economic blow will come in this uh, in this fall. That, that discussion, by the way, is also uh, accessible through the blog of the hotel school. Uh. Yeah, I wonder different uh, regions and whether there is uh, any effect. Um, of course, you have the population size that, that may matter, for instance, uh, uh, had the number of people that go to restaurants or, or bars uh, in, in Sweden and in Finland and Norway is, is, is lower and, and they have more distance anyway. Uh, other countries that are less affected, um, the fear that different countries have. So, it, um, yeah, and, and the measures that they take to prevent these kind of uh, uh, um, confidence uh, problems that public uh, has, uh, what difference that makes. Uh, do you look into different scenarios also for for these kind of measures that are taken in different regions uh, how uh, what kind of effects uh, these have or different measures it's yeah, very, yeah. very complicated uh, modeling of course uh, i presume yeah. we are doing a scenario study with an international company and uh, it it will not such uh, not so much be economic modeling uh, because that indeed is is very hard to do because um one of the main things um, in the discussion that we had is uh, let's go back to the previous major crises that we have had in 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 the last uh, since uh, 1873, and and you always see that if you have a really uh, a big crisis like the one that we're having now, uh, there is a complexity of different factors that that may have caused the crisis, and that historians after the fact are debating which one was the decisive uh, thing in the crisis. Now, um, currently we are all, um, uh, and, uh, no, uh, logically, we are all um, obsessed with, with the pandemic, so that is our main concern. But uh, we see side effects, we see uh, concurrent trends, and, and, and one of those trends is, uh, is uh, the resurgence of, uh, of uh, political nationalism. And, uh, and protectionism, and uh, that goes in hand in hand with the sentiment of a crisis. So, uh, strangely enough, a, a pandemic or, or viruses always uh, uh, have something to do with uh, xenophobia. So they stimulate xenophobia. So uh, uh, it it, it uh, increases the fear of impurity among some people of people from other countries. So to give an example, people may think, well, this person is coming from Brazil. That's a highly effective country. So I'm now afraid of Brazilians. 
So uh, that, that is that sentiment. There's also a more rational sentiment that says, well, the globalized supply chains that we have are falling apart right now. So we need more uh, protectionism. But you also see in a discussion between France and Spain. So France, the Renault, uh, uh, Renault is now a different company, but they're, they're trying to, to or they're discussing bringing back uh, the, the plants, that, uh, the car manufacturing plants from Spain to France. So you see that level of protectionism, that is one thing. You see these strange skirmishes on the Indian-Chinese uh, border where the Indian and the Chinese army attack each other with sticks and stones. You see other uh, uh, red, uh, red flags around the world. Um, you have the economic, you have the social economic turmoil with, uh, with Black Lives Matter. Uh, that will only uh, become worse if, if poverty becomes a big problem. So uh, probably this is the beginning of a, of a, of a larger crisis that, um, that we will have to disentangle 30 years from now what, what was really happening and what has happened first and what has caused what. Mm. Yeah, yeah. The and, and so yeah. If you look at scenarios, and that, that is what we do, we, we basically think of reasonings, uh, if, if X, then Y, mm -hmm. and if A, then B. So we look at, uh, at signposts along the way, at, at early warning signals. If, if this happens, if you see that ongoing trend toward protectionism, then that may be the most likely outcome. That's, that is the way we, we reason in this type of studies. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Chaotic modeling is uh, very hard in uh, such an instance. If there's, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I want to uh, thank you for uh, for your presentation and for asking these questions. And it's a, a fascinating uh, discussion it's turning into. Uh, so I'm sorry I have to end it, but we uh, reached the end of our time, and it's been uh, a pleasure listening to you. Uh, thank you very much for joining us and for uh, sharing your ideas and. Uh, answering our questions. It's been a pleasure for me as well. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.